In the name of the one, holy, and undivided Trinity. Amen. When I was a teenager living among Mother Teresa's sisters for a while, I noticed an odd and intentional quirk of their language. Their work was to provide shelter to 25 homeless pregnant women in Los Angeles and to their young children, most of whom had shipwrecked on the shores of that shelter after great trauma, both intimate and structural. Lots of the women did sex work, many were living with addiction, several had crossed national borders without papers, most of them had been beaten by a partner. In our view of the world, in our society, these are bad women, shameful women, the kind of women we use as warnings to little girls. But the nuns, the sisters, always called the residents of the shelter the ladies. It's time for the ladies' dinner. The ladies need to be in the van by 10. Which of the ladies is cooking tonight? Now. Feminism has had a lot to say about ladies as a term, and uh, it is sometimes true that lady is not exactly a compliment. I hear all of that. But in this context, it was an act of rebellion, and it was born of their practice of mercy. All of the connotations of good breeding and gentility and wealth and sophistication, all of the affectations of aristocracy and ladyhood, all of those things that the world exalts, all of that was nothing to them. They didn't care about who was king or prime minister or president. What they saw when they looked at the world was the poor as the honored and the elite and the sacred. The residents of the house were their aristocrats. The ladies of the house were to be served and honored. And they were never lectured or scolded or subtly pressured to shape up. What is the relationship between God's judgment and God's mercy? The author of the letter attributed to James says something very curious. He instructs us to so speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be without mercy to anyone who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So we notice that for this author, the dual truths of God's judgment and mercy are in dynamic relationship to one another. And we hear a lot in Christian chatter, right, in the air, Christian culture, 
about love and forgiveness. These are two words that get used a lot. And sometimes these deep concepts are given less than their due and thrown around in ways that betray their true meanings. It is disputed, for example, within American Christianity operating in a neoliberal economic environment, what it means to love someone. Is it to have a nice warm feeling about them? Is it to care for their material needs? If that person is gay or an immigrant or Muslim, is it loving them to welcome them as they are or demand that they change because you love them? These are not settled questions in our public arena. Somehow, though, the concept of mercy has resisted this co-optation so far. This idea that there is an option for something that is freely given and holy, an open hand instead of a fist, a heart of flesh where there was a heart of stone, a way of being together that is first and always rooted in belovedness. God's mercy acknowledges what is, acknowledges failure, harm, trauma, and then offers the possibility of a vibrant peace in place of chaos or capitulation. It offers healing in the place of festering wounds. It offers a way of seeing royalty where the world sees scum and shame. For most of us, when we feel threatened, we experience a range of responses. Our bodies and our brains are wired for what is sometimes described as fight, flight, freeze, appease. When strangeness or newness invades our lives, when it comes unasked, when it comes violently, we trend toward these responses. Some of us are primed to lash out physically, and this, honestly, was a very good response when it was, you know, a saber-toothed tiger attacking your cave. It's, sometimes it's appropriate to have a healthy adrenaline response, right? You hear these stories about um, parents getting superhuman strength when their babies are trapped under a car, right? That's a good, that's a healthy thing. I'm glad that's in the system. Some of us run away, which is also a completely appropriate response to some threats. Some of us freeze. This is also a good evolutionary strategy with some predators to play dead. Um, I tend to engage in this one by reacting to challenge by locking myself in a room with a cinnamon roll and a quilt and Anne of Green Gables and just hoping it goes away. <laughs> just fine for a while, I just can't stay there forever, however tempting it might be. Some of us appease, right? We've learned to suck up to the predator, to stay close and protected to that powerful one. In today's gospel reading, we hear Jesus be challenged. We hear about a troubling encounter between Jesus and a woman with a sick daughter. When she comes, not just to ask, but to beg for her little daughter's healing, Jesus reacts without mercy. His response is essentially lockdown. He tells her that what he has to offer is for his own kind first, his own people, and not for hers. And he uses a turn of phrase that indicates that his people are human and her people are dogs. If you are made uncomfortable by this story, good. She then
faces him and does what many, many, many women do when trying to access what we need from a gatekeeper or a system that doesn't want us or believe in us. And tries to slip in the back door. She takes his own rationale, his own words, and uses them against him. It's funny, it's tricky, and it's smart. In this story, the scum woman needs mercy, and she knows it. And she convinces Jesus to stand in the fullness of his mercy. And he says something to her that we should all retain in our hearts for pondering, because he tells her for saying this, for this saying, this word, this story, this logos in the Greek, your daughter is healed. It is the only instance in the scriptures of this word, the logos, the thing that was in the beginning with God, when it is used to refer to a person other than Jesus. He tells her that she gave the word to the word. No small feat. And Jesus, fully human, fully God, does the strangest thing of all, and the rarest and most precious in our world, he changes his mind. He examines his first reaction, which is both learned and instinctive, realizes it is wrong, and corrects. He opens like a blossom in spring. The dam has been broken. His healing is now for all. We are sitting together at the beginning of this program year as Christchurch in the beating heart of the University District in Seattle, Washington. There's a lot coming this year. We are looking forward to a year where we're going to have some consultant help to take a missional snapshot of who we are right now and who we want to be. We're going to be looking at a new organ and probably a capital campaign for that new organ and the rearranging of the chancel for that instrument. We're launching new worship services, sending out the word to people whose lives are not yet touched by the love and faithfulness of this place. And more things are coming that we haven't yet planned for. We are standing on a plot of ground that I get emails about all the time from developers who want to buy it and build yet another 20-story building. We are standing on this plot of ground at a moment in our city's history that will go down in the books to be analyzed and studied. These huge buildings shooting up out of the ground all around us. We are living in the middle of a time in our national history where truth appears to be up for grabs, where increasing numbers of people are being driven to sickness and death and poverty by the very few at the very top who refuse to understand that they have enough. How, what, how might we take our cues on this Sunday, in this place, as this called and chosen people from the curious story that troubles us today?
How might we choose mercy here again and again and again with each other even after suspicion or hurt? How might we look with the eyes of mercy and see our sidewalks and alleyways as crammed with the aristocracy of heaven? How might we examine our own first reactions to challenge, to the newness and challenge of our time? How might we acknowledge, just acknowledge, our own desire to curl up in the comforting quilt of the past and the known, lock the door and hope that this strange new world goes away. And then, like Jesus, release that desire entirely and place ourselves wholly in the hands of God. How might we frame each question as it comes to us, both as a parish and as citizens, not as, what does it do for me, or people like me, or my kind? But instead, like Jesus, break the dam. Let the mercy flow and start asking, is this for everyone? Who's been left out? Is there a scorned woman and her sick daughter who might benefit here? If so, how can I serve them before I serve myself and before I protect my own? We live in a broken and holy time, a time of great evil and of an even greater upswell of kind and furious generosity. God has come knocking at our assumptions and our smallness and our job is to surrender and release and heal to be mercy, to be a beacon of mercy, to see with mercy, to be willing to let mercy do her work on us from the inside out. It is a hard time and a good time. And it has never been a better time to be together, praying and learning and offering and challenging and listening. Here we go. <laughs>